Tonight we're going to look at the subject of prayer and will. Kind of interesting one, and we'll just dive right into it. Yes. First we'll start off with a quote from Master Samuel Ward. The great work is, first of all, the creation of the true human being by dint of our will, based on conscious labors and voluntary sufferings. So this is kind of a good, good quote. It kind of lets you know the overview of what's involved with the Gnostic work. Conscious labors, we're working with a purpose to achieve something. Voluntary suffering, that's because we're trying to distance ourselves from the ego and the desires that we identify with that are brought to us by the ego. So, no by gonna, dint, what does he mean, dint? Uh, the true human being is, is uh, the true being is by dint of our will, by the use of our will, oh. by using our willpower. So, just kind of a different word. <laughs> yeah. So, through the use of our willpower, based oh, on conscious right, labors exactly. and voluntary What's that? Uh, and we were saying maybe he, when Spanish, someone translated it. That's that right. This is very, this is very possible. The word yeah. Because I've never heard Some of Some of the words. books you can see, yeah. you can see the different translations. Yeah. Yes, yes. It's, exactly. it's, it's, it's all pretty much similar, saying they use different words just because of translation. We'll talk a little bit about that actually mm -hmm. in this lecture. Before we go on, we're going to talk about something that he tells us, <coughs> the level of the being. He talks about it in many of his books, especially his books near the end. The level of the being. So there, first we'll look at many different social levels exist. This is something that we're aware of. We see it every day outside in society, many different social levels, economic situations, people who are interested in different things, people who are striving for different things. This is an obvious statement. Society is made up of people who all exist in different ways. There are people of the church and of the brothels, <laughs> Drunkards and the abstemious, honorable and the shameless, etc. <coughs> the mass or society <coughs> is the sum of the individuals. So our society is equal to the sum of all the individuals who make up that society. The transformation of the mass of nations is not possible without the transformation of the individual. This is something that's kind of important we need to try and realize. This is one of the reasons why we work on ourselves. Because if we don't change ourselves, we, we can change very little. This is why a president might come in and the nation has great hopes, but everything stays the same. Because unless people change, the nation doesn't change. All of society is just a representation, an external <coughs> representation of the individuals who make up that society. That's why you see something of everything. Drunkards, abstemious, honorable, shameless. All these different opposing ways of living that people all seem to choose one path or another, and all these people come together to make up the society. Well, along with that, many different levels of being also exist. The different levels of being attract the diverse circumstances of life. We must make the effort to know what our particular level of being is, our moral level. <coughs> moral level isn't a direct translation, it's just kind of like, I'll say moral level, because people might kind of understand what we're talking about when we say being, sometimes that word, that we relate all well, the inner being, and the, uh, this and that, but when we say the level of the being, we're talking something similar to moral level, but not quite as shallow as just saying your moral level, just so we can start to get an idea of what exactly we're saying here. So what are you saying? We'll get to it, but <laughs> all things, all, <laughs> all circumstances that occur outside of ourselves are the reflections of what we carry within. When we change internally uh, that, them, the exterior circumstances of life will also change. So what we're saying is like just how society is made up of many different types of people, <coughs> drunkards and <coughs> religious, and all these people represent different levels of being. An internal being that we all, all of us, are at a specific internal. Uh, we have a specific level of being internally. So this is yes. I want to ask you. So if everyone, like, if everyone affects everything else around them, so my level of being, does it affect only my circumstances in my life? Uh, most directly, it does. Yeah, most directly. But it can affect other people as well. The people close to you, like. 
we know the way we act, the things that we okay. say affect the one people around okay, us. Yeah. This is why when we talk about that you have to, the, the individual has to change himself to change society, you change yourself, you change your circumstances, you change the people around you, you affect people positively, then maybe it trickles on and they affect people, and it all started with you because you changed your reaction. But does, but also do with circumstances, you attract circum, certain circumstances right. just by, uh, you know, the way you are, you yeah. know, like if you're a very negative person, you're going to attract more exactly. negative, uh, that's what we're, that, that's exactly what we're saying. Like, more negativity, yeah. you know, will right. come towards you because you are angry, so oh, yes. it kind of, but if you're a more positive type of person, you yeah. get more positive, uh, mm -hmm. being attracted by, back this is what we're talking about, this is what we mean by a level of being, like someone who is, a level of being is like a drunkard. They are always attract around them other people who like to drink, and they'll always attract around them those scenes that occur to people who drink a lot. And yes. just as an example, but this yeah. can be used. People who are de devout Christians will attract around them other devout Christians. They will so or thieves or yeah, yeah, whatever. Yeah. So yeah, all whatever. of those people that would constitute a level of being. internal being. Yes, the, the way that we are internally right right now. Yes, like what our level of being is currently that is drawing the circumstances of life to us. Okay. Gotcha. So level of being can also be seen as like a marvelous ladder. I know this is a staircase, but the symbology is the same. <laughs> Very nice. Yes. yes. William Blake. <laughs> William Oh William Blake. Yes. Of course. We find ourselves on one rung of the ladder. Below are people who are worse than us and above are people who are better in their level of being. That's one way we can look at it. We are, we are on one rung, but we can climb to another rung. A higher level of being is directly above us from instant to instant. So titles, ranks, promotions, etc. in the physical world cannot raise us to the superior step in the level of being. That's why I say it's kind of important to objectively view ourselves and see what is our current level of being, where are we, like, to use the example of the drunkard again, if he were to change his level of being, if he were to say, hmm, this has not been a positive influence in my life, so I will stop being a drunkard, he would then start to draw to himself circumstances that were different than what he would be for if he was to stay at that particular level of the being. Mm -hmm. This is not something that we're stuck in. We're not no. stuck in the level of the being that we are at right now. We can move to a higher level, I guess. Equally, we could move to a lower level That's right, as well. You could fall as well. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of one of these things that we need to think about. We need to try and reflect on what is my level of being. People who are interested in spiritual knowledge or spiritual things will attract other people who are interested in spiritual things, like <laughs> groups like this or whatever. But that doesn't mean that we've made it or that we're there. We just we need to be kind of conscious of what effect we're having externally, what internally is affecting us, what is our precise level of the being. This is one of those subjects that is a little difficult to grasp at first, the level of being, and if you research it a little more on your own time, you, this is one of those subjects in Gnosis that you'll, you will get a lot from. But trying to explain it totally here would be a little difficult. Maybe we probably do a whole lecture on level of the being. But I just wanted to kind of introduce it at this level, because he talks about it in some of his books, and maybe you've read it in some of his books, but it's one of those subjects that's important to this study. This is all a quote from uh, Master Samuel. A number of activities belong to each level of the being. When one moves to a higher level of the being, one has to take a leap and abandon all the activities that one had in the inferior level of the being. Like we said, the drunkard wants to better himself, the first thing he has to do is Stop being a drunk and <laughs> attract different circumstances. Into my memory come all those times in my life, 20, 30, 40 years ago, that were transcended. Why? It is because I found superior levels of the being. So there will be things that we're doing right now, but because of our level of being, we feel these are the most important things. We have to do these. These are all consuming. And then maybe down the road, we, our level of being will have changed, and we would have thought, Maybe I shouldn't have been so all-encompassed with this thing or that thing. Maybe I should have been more focused on internal work or whatever it is. 
If one moves into a superior level of the being, then many things that are presently important to oneself have to be left behind, because those things belong to the level in which we were. Therefore, the psychological transaction into another level of the being includes a leap. That is a rebellious leap. It is never of an evolving type. It is always a revolutionary dialectic leap. So this leap is never an evolving type. What does that mean? That means there's no law in nature that's going to move us mechanically from one level of being to another. Or from one level of being to a higher level of being anyways. This is something we have to work on ourselves. <clears throat> So, that's why he says it's a rebellious leap. It's rebelling against the forces of nature that want to, like I believe, law of entropy you learned about. Yeah, yes. yeah I was yeah. just going to say yes. that. Yeah. Yeah. Gonna say Very that. related to that. Yes. The law of entropy wants to keep everything. Nature. Yes. That's We're right. We are. Of nature. Right. Yeah, we are going against nature. So, right. it's mm. so uh, harder mm. to make that leap. Yeah. That's you right. Know? Oh, yes. Because you know, those, there's laws that want to keep everything uh, kind of neutral mm. or path of least resistance is what everything wants to fall back down to, but we're trying to continually put energy in, to build ourselves up, to put energy in, to learn, to, to grow, to move. But you know, uh, since there are all the things that, uh, if one moves into a superior level of being, then many things that are presently important to oneself have to be left behind. So, say, say if you think Gnosis is important to you, do you leave that behind? Or, I mean, you know? No, the things that you're trying to change. If you want to change something, mm -hmm. it well could be. If you want to change being a Gnostic person, then would that be? Well, I know. Well, but it's a superior it's a, level. So what's the superior level to Gnosis? If you find that. Well, no. Right. But even if you're a Gnosis, you, doesn't mean you're in a superior level. Right. You know. I mean, it's within it's Gnosis you know, that you might have left things like it may have made you realize that you leave behind like material things don't put as much importance mm -hmm. yeah. because on even, that. even within gnosis i mean uh, you know you have to climb higher and higher so yeah. say if, if if one thing was really important right now when you come to you i don't know you go to a higher level of being you have to leave that behind because that was in awesome. your inferior right. being is that it? it it can be i mean the example of gnosis is pretty extreme, but it could possibly, I mean, I don't think from the whole idea behind the whole structure of Gnosis is to self-realize, to incarnate your own higher yeah. being. And so that's a process, not, isn't it? Yeah, it's a process. Yeah. So um, there's teachers and masters who help us along the way, but I, eventually the end goal would be to be your own master. We need guidance, but at some point the idea is that your inner being will guide you. So I guess that's one example of or, or is it like every time you uh, uh, eliminate an ego, you're at a different level of being, aren't you? You are. Because yeah. that means that you've comprehended yeah. a specific psychological error or That's defect right. that has kept you in a specific That's right. exactly. level of being. And now right. you've comprehended it fully, you've eliminated it, and now you've transcended that particular behavior. That's right. That. Ego. And then you go on to the next one, and yep. the next one. Exactly. And there could be so many. <laughs> That's true. You move up a lot. Yep. <laughs> one wrong at a time. <laughs> Mark All right. So we're going to move in, we're going to talk about willpower, and we're going to do a little bit of audience participation right now. We all see this word, willpower, and I want everyone just to, in your mind, look at it. Think of the first thing that comes to mind, how you would define Willpower. Just everyone, just take one second. Don't think about too much. Just and uh, so everyone basically has it. Now, <laughs> basically. Willpower. Willpower. Yeah. Now we're gonna ask everybody just for a brief. What is willpower? Two words, maybe three words, whatever. We can start with the ladies if we like. Strength. Strength. Good. Yeah, yeah. strength. I okay. was gonna say sure. to suffer. <laughs> <laughs> sure, to suffer, strength, to suffer, sure. Can't think of a word right now. I think it's fair enough. <laughs> Harry? Uh, First thing, you don't have to overthink it. Willpower. Uh, oh, I thought of something. Sure. Determination. Determination. Oh, That's yeah. a good one. Yeah, yeah. determination. <laughs> It's not a test. You have to pick this your own words. I know. Hurry up. Go on, Go on. Okay. Justin? Meditation. 
meditation, no problem, it takes dorsal again. Maybe a special and rare ability. Yep. The human beings need to acquire. Yep. Sure. They all said that. Okay. <laughs> it's already Good. been said. Good. Sure. That's that's fine. Will power to fine. have the courage yeah. and strength. The courage and strength. <laughs> yep. Strength to to, to uh, do strength. what you know is right yep. and uh, to overcome whatever. Right. Good. That's these are all and these are all really those are all good answers and they're all they're all correct. Anyone would would say they're all equally correct. Those all define willpower. But this that does lead us to another interesting aspect of of the psyche, the psyche, that would be that we have a word, willpower, and this word may have a different definition to every single person who sees it. This is something that makes learning for us difficult. It makes communicating with one another difficult. This is this is because they're in our the way that we are. We're we kind of lack what's called the exactness of terminology. That way, if you read a book or you read a Samael book or you talk to your neighbor, and then you, are you really understanding what they're trying to say? Because every single word that we speak pretty much has multiple definitions. Even if you were to look up willpower in the dictionary, mm -hmm. it would have multiple definitions. Mm -hmm. So this, that is an interesting thing. That's because our minds are very subjective. So when we, when we see a word, we don't just have the definition. We also have what we uh, relate to being from our own life, what that word is meant to us, what that word brings to mind of our own memories of our past, maybe. So this is this is one thing that does make progress in reading books, especially older books, and stuff like that makes it difficult because we don't we don't tru do we truly maybe we do, but do we truly understand what the author was trying to say, or have we put our own definitions into words mm -hmm. that he's used or or she has used? Look at the Bible. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> really? Well, we know the real truth now. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well. <laughs> <laughs> but, <it's, laughs> but it does go to illustrate one of the points we try to make about our subjective reality. Yeah. This is how we view everything through our own experience, through our own definitions. Or what do we want it to mean? Yep. Yeah. You know? So that's that's one thing that maybe spend a little time thinking on. It's, it's hard to know how to actually listen to what the words that are actually being spoke, spoken because everything that we receive is filtered through the ego. It's mm -hmm. filtered through our own experience, through our own memories and our own past. Anyways, we'll move on. <laughs> that, was, that was interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so we can define willpower as conscious labor and voluntary suffering. Oh, you said suffering. Yep. It's voluntary hard. suffering. Mm -hmm. yeah. Voluntary. Yeah, because that's what willpower is. If uh, mm -hmm. someone wants to quit smoking, for example, they have oh, to they yeah. have to suffer. Yes. Because they want to smoke every minute of the day. Labor. Yeah, but they consciously they know, no, I'm working towards a goal, and internally they are suffering. Mm -hmm. But that's what willpower is. People who don't have willpower are when we go path of least resistance. We do whatever our mind desires at any given time. What's the easiest? The easiest way. The easiest path. Yeah. Whatever desire pops in our head, that's what we go for. And then the next one, and the next one, constantly moved, a million directions a mm -hmm. day, constantly moved by mm -hmm. external forces, without guiding ourselves in a particular direction. So, this is an example of conscious labor and voluntary suffering. Do you have a? There was a lecture, I think, by Lee yeah. about the mm -hmm. four paths. Mm -hmm. This is a fakir. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Fakir, right. Where they would stand in positions like this for days or weeks or months so that they could conquer the physical body was their sole objective, to develop the willpower and control over the physical body. So there are three types of actions that we're going to look at. Those which c correspond to the law of accidents, those which belong to the law of recurrence, and actions which are intentionally determined by the conscious willpower. So those which correspond to the law of accidents. The law of accidents works on those who are psychologically asleep. A lack of attention to oneself and one's surroundings leaves us blind to the external forces that influence. 
influences. So it's, I mean, we, we studied karma a lot. We looked into karma that the ego draws specific karmas that need to be paid. But there's another law too, and this, and this is the law of accidents. Why does it work on us? Because we're unconscious of our actions. We don't know what our actions are going to bring us. So it's not necessarily that everything we do is we're receiving karma or paying karma. Some of it is falls under the law of accidents. It's like if we were all just driving our cars around in a fog, not exactly sure where everyone is, where people are going to crash into each other. This is an example of the law of accidents. Not, not the actual example of cars crashing into each other. This is how we are in our personal lives. We don't know what, how what we say affects people. We don't know our actions, how they affect people. Other people aren't conscious of how their actions are affecting people, and then because of this, everyone being psychologically asleep, we will we will be uh, we, will, we will have to live with the law of accidents that some of these things are just going to happen in death as well. It's possible, yeah, because like, is there <laughs> deaths that are accidents? There, yeah, there can be. It's a, it's a law. So I know it seems strange to me. I, I, like I, that aren't supposed to be. Yeah, this is possible. Mm -hmm. This is possible. Law of accidents that that people can die, and then they will be, they will be compensated for that. If they die as a result of the law of accidents, they'll be compensated somehow. Like the law, there is a law that will make sure that it's not just un, an unjust thing that happens to them that they have to live with, but. Yep, the law of accidents is one of those laws that exists. I just can't see that happening. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. Well, there are, there are many, many laws. Mm -hmm. right? And this is one of them, the law of accidents. So this is... It's something that we can study further, if we like. But the, there are a lot of laws we can look into. I mean, we've looked over some of the main ones that are the most prevalent so far. This one hasn't really been talked about too much. Well, wouldn't that be like a, a lack of attention to one's surroundings? Like if you were, you know that there, it's an avalanche uh, warning, but you go out, um, you know, yep. heli skiing or something, and and are killed in an avalanche. Because would that would that be a law or or is that of accidents or maybe karma too, right? Yep, it's possible. But the law of accidents basically states that there is a law that says accidents will happen in the universe. That not that. D despite the, the best like oversight and mm -hmm. everything, there are there is a margin of error. And you could be uh, drawn into someone else's karma, right? Like exactly. they have to be in the car accident, and they have yep. to be. This is possible. But you're psychologically asleep when you have an accident. Yeah, maybe you're not. Yeah, you're not aware. Well, lack of conscious. Attention well, I mean, this, this, this is how all of us basically like live our see him there days. Over the center mm -hmm. line. Right. Yeah, you know, sometimes uh, the law, the, the karma, uh, the laws of karma, they take the law of accidents to fulfill the karma of some people. People, yeah. Like the master tells the story of a young, uh, some young people who died in a car accident, in a mm -hmm. terrible car accident. Mm -hmm. And then um, he decided to investigate in them, mm -hmm. in their past lives. Mm -hmm. And then he found out that uh, the guys were like in a previous life, they were like beating some other people, mm -hmm. defenseless people. Mm -hmm. They beat those people without any reason, just just for fun, you know. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah, they so, were violent, yeah. and they, they was, uh, then they died in an accident, mm -hmm. a car accident. Mm -hmm. But uh, the law of karma can also, uh, these laws can be an instrument. But well, what if the guy's had a girlfriend in the car and she dies too? Mm -hmm. Then is she part of the law of accident? If she's, the, if the, she's kind if of she has a karma, she will pay. She doesn't have karma, she will be just yeah. released or for minor accident. Right. Sometimes, mm -hmm. uh, if, for instance, a person by law of accident dies, uh, let's say, 25 years old for some accident, then she will be back immediately. To yeah. pay, to repay, or, or to Regain. to continue living the, yeah. the oh. amount of time that but it, it, that's what we were saying. If the death occurs and as an accident, and it will be repaid in some way. I would add that the 
the, this law, even the people who are, even the masters, they are sometimes they can be caught by the law of accidents. Mm -hmm. Even the gods. Yep. Sometimes the, oh. the cosmic universal law accidents. There have been well, crashes of UFOs. Yep. For instance. Oh. Okay. Yeah. There's law supposedly of there, you yeah. know higher spiritually advanced people, so uh -huh. accidents happen too. <laughs> yep. This is true. So this is, it's an interesting one that people, mm -hmm. whenever yeah. we bring it up, people get, yeah, this is very interesting. <laughs> they, they get comfortable with the ideas of karma and then start getting comfortable with things they understand and we always got to throw something else yeah. in there that gets them going, what is with these guys? But, the law of accidents. So we'll move on to the, those which belong to the law of recurrence, which one everyone's a little more comfortable with. Each life we repeat all that we did in the previous life, this is recurrence. A vicious cycle of the repetition of dramas, romances, events, and encounters with the same people. So these are the three, three types of actions that happen that drive people. So the law of recurrence, I guess we don't really have to go over too long. I think it's been driven home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we know it's, we know it's yeah, the law of recurrence that we have to come back to the physical, we repeat what we've done. Uh, we know that it's similar to but not the same as reincarnation which is uh, what masters can do when they intentionally pick the circumstances surrounding their return to the physical this is more like we have to recur in the same uh, situations to repay the karmas that we've we've acquired and the third is the actions which are intentionally determined by the conscious willpower the conscious willpower is the essence the connection to the inner being these are actions which are the result of the being manifesting through us. So these are what we call intentionally determined by the conscious willpower. Yes. Okay, so the, the idea um, being expressed here, then just to make sure I got this right. Um, uh, so the level of being is, is really um, how we use our conscious willpower to decide which laws govern our life. Do we, do we want to stay unconscious and let the law of accidents govern our lives? Or, mm -hmm. Uh, or like, can we can we right. uh, re revolve or create some sort of revolution of the consciousness, and then we realize we're uh, being governed then by recurrence. So like our egos keep coming back right. until we destroy them, and then uh, through the conscious willpower. So like the third one is, is that the idea being expressed? Well, the idea is that like in everyday life, these are the three types of actions that drive okay. people. People are driven by the law of accidents, the law of recurrence, and this. Is a third one that is more rare, but this is another way of that, that are uh, these are another type of action. This is the result of, of the being manifesting through us, or us using our essence manifesting through us. So that we are actually doing the will of our inner father instead of the will of ourselves. This is the idea. Well, for that to have to be, wouldn't you have to? Uh Awaken to consciousness. Yeah. To, you know, to, to uh, have conscious willpower and do the uh, and be connected to your inner being and to do the uh, work. You at the very least have to be at least working on yourself. Seriously. Well, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So but these are the three actions, three types of actions. The common and current acts of mankind are always either the results of the law of recurrence or the mere product. Of mechanical accidents. So those are the two most common. This is what everyday life is, the product of, because people are unaware of themselves, they're unaware of their actions, they're unaware of their surroundings, so they're pretty much governed by recurrence and mechanical accidents. Yeah, mechanical. They just go through the motion. Exactly. Without even thinking about yep. it. Yep. So who's, whosoever has their willpower, willpower bottled up in the ego is a victim of circumstances. So when we are controlled and run entirely by the ego, we will always be a victim of circumstances. These things will always happen to us. We will always feel a victim. We'll never know why. We'll never comprehend. That's why, like we said, it's important to understand the level of being, but even when you do start to work on yourself, you'll see that these are all laws. Even when you're coming to another level, higher awareness of yourself, it's not so much that you can choose which laws govern you and which ones don't anymore. It's just more that Instead of driving around in the fog with your lights off, now you have your lights on. And you can see what's coming your way. Mm -hmm. Instead of 
but these are like these laws are laws that govern like Doris Mel said they govern masters they govern gods but to be aware of them that's a powerful thing because now <laughs> you, you can adjust certain situations so that they don't hit you so hard or so that you can not have to have the effects of these laws that's why we work on disintegration of the ego because the ego is what attracts the karma and what the karma is there to balance is the ego. You lose the ego, you don't need to be balanced by karma. Whosoever possesses free willpower can originate new circumstances. Only persons who have liberated their willpower through the death of the myself shall be able to accomplish new acts born from their free willpower. So this is what we've been talking about the whole time, about being either driven by the ego or by the inner being. It's the ego or the essence, right? So persons, only persons who have liberated their willpower or their essence through the death of the myself or the ego shall be able to accomplish new acts born from their free willpower. So we'll be able to drive ourselves in a specific direction that we want to go. But we can also change the circumstances of our life by changing our level of being as well. So, so the problems of life are nothing but mental forms with two poles, one negative and the other, or one positive and the other negative. Problems are sustained by the mind and are created by the mind. This is if you start to work with self-observation, you will, you will begin to realize this, that if there's some particular thing you're dreading at work, say you have a situation that you're not looking forward to dealing with, that will start to become a problem in the morning when you start thinking about it. We start saying, oh no, today at 3 o'clock I have to do this thing that I don't want to do, and then, uh, and then 7.30 in the morning and you've already created a problem for yourself where one doesn't exist yet. You see? Sustained by the mind and created by the mind. And maybe when that time comes and you have to deal with that situation that you were, maybe it goes better than you had expected. Maybe, maybe it wasn't a big deal. And then how much energy, how much time, how much of your own life have you wasted putting in your energy into <laughs> developing this negative idea that, oh no, this situation is going to ruin my day before it has even occurred. See? But I find a lot of times if you start off with such a negative attitude, um, it builds. Yeah. And then you get more and more, you know, like, and so you talk yourself into having a lousy day or whatever, yeah, that's exactly it. you know, and whereas it didn't have to be, but, uh, and then you get to it and then you're just so, so uptight and then it will turn ro ro rotten because, you know, you, you're just so psyched up. Mm -hmm. You're just in such a negative space. Exactly. Or, or it could go the other way too, like there's many times, and on my work, I work on cars, so there'll be a car that I know is coming back that I, was, I had worked on it. Something wrong with this deal. What did I do wrong? I get, oh man, I'm gonna come back. They're not gonna be happy. What did I do? Did, did I do something? I, I'm thinking. I'm trying to what, go back my mind. What did I do? Did what? What was it that I did that wasn't correct on the car? And how much of a pain is this gonna be to fix? And is this guy gonna be mad at me? Or <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. the car comes back. This is an ex this is an example of that. And I, I I take apart the thing I've done, and I realize oh, it was nothing that I've done. The part that came in was was wired backwards, basically, from the people who made it. So here I am thinking I've totally destroyed something, yeah. I've done it wrong, because, yeah. oh, I'm a lousy mechanic, and all these other things that run through yeah. your head, yeah. and it turns out not to be the case. Yeah, yeah, you start beating But if we were observing yourself. ourselves and we were saying, well, what, what is this? Is this an ego that, what is this ego, and how is it affecting me? Well, I see, I'm, I'm coming pulled down, I'm feeling heavy, and now the job that I am currently working on I'm not focusing enough attention on it because my mind is trying to think of this other problem that's coming down the line tomorrow or whatever. So what ego would that be? Like, you know, the ego that makes you think, you know, that gets you into that kind of slump, right? It could, it could be, like, it could be the manifestation of many different egos, right? Of, like, fear or, of like, or yeah. the feeling of... Being not good enough? Yeah. Oh, I'm, all not, these I'm not a good enough mechanic The problem is, or yeah, whatever. all these things, you know, yeah. they, these ideas will pop into our head and then all of a sudden we'll grab them and we'll identify with it. Oh no, this is going to be a problem. And then once we're identified with it, we become fascinated with it and then it absorbs our, our thoughts 
uh, yeah. our energy. Yeah. It's and so is it really a problem? Yeah. Has it been a problem yet? No. But in our mind, we've already made it one. Yeah. That's so true. <laughs> that is. Yep. yep. Oops. So the essence is trapped within the battle of the opposites. The likes, the dislikes, yes, no, good and evil. This is something that has been said before. But this is what the essence. This is what the ego does. He, he always tries to pull us one way and then the other way and the other way and the other way. keep our mind always moving, always being pulled in different directions. And this is what the, the essence is trapped in. Willpower is only possible by dissolving the ego. We must accept that the human mind is conditioned and if we want to control the mind, it is urgent to know ourselves. So the human mind is conditioned. It's preconditioned to act mechanically to certain situations. We start to become aware of that, and this is how we begin to change. Because, you know, say, even, even when at night you want to say, all right, this week I'm putting five minutes a night aside to meditate. This is an act of willpower. This is, this mm -hmm. is also an act. This is how you build it, because then five minutes starts to work into your routine, then ten minutes, then twenty minutes, and then your willpower is growing the whole time. Why? Because you're voluntary suffering and conscious labor. You're saying, I want to I want to connect with my inner being. I want to know if these things that these fellows are saying is true. Or, and I want to, this is what I want to do. But to do that, I have to suffer a bit because, oh, there's a really interesting program on tonight. Or I have to go out and garden. Or a million other things that we have to do at any given moment. Or you'd like to do, yeah, yeah, to distract yourself. There's a million distractions. The world yeah. is a distraction. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> so will and desire are two poles of the same thing. They're two different poles of the same thing, one positive and one negative. The will is positive and the desire is negative. Many mistake the will for the desire and the desire for the will. They're two poles of the same thing, like hot and cold. It's both temperature. Will, power, and desire... They're on the same pole, but they're opposites. They're exact opposites. Like the flip side of a coin. Exactly. Same coin. Though. Yep. So, so sometimes we have a desire, and then we, we uh, mistaken that for will. Like, oh, I really saw that. I saw that new car, and I liked it a lot. I, I, I would like to get that car, and then this, then we think, well, it was going to take will. You know, I got to put my willpower into. Is that a will or is it a desire? We have to meditate on it. We have to try and understand that these aren't the same things. They're, 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 they're the opposite. Desire enslaves the will. It's just like saying the ego enslaves the consciousness or the essence. Desires are the egos that blind us from doing the will of the Father. The will of the Father. What is it? This is the will of the internal Father. Of our inner being. Sometimes we, sometimes it's easier for us to pay attention to it, and sometimes we feel like, no, I, I'm starting to connect with the inner being, and then other times we have all these other desires, and life itself pretty much gets in the way, and this makes us seem like we're too busy to work on the path. We can't even find five minutes a night to try and meditate or, or whatever. Yeah. Now we'll get into prayer. Without prayer, we cannot develop the will. To pray is to talk to God, to try to communicate with our internal Father. Direct your prayer within, seeking within your interior your Divine Mother. Thus, with sincere supplications, you shall be able to talk to her. Beg her to disintegrate the eye that you have previously observed and judged. As the sense of self-observation develops, it shall permit you to verify the pro progress, uh, progressive advancement of your work. So by using self-observation, you strengthen self-observation. Well, when you strengthen this, this will be able to let you know if you're progressing and where and how you've progressed. Because you'll be able to, to see it. For an example, like if you always react the same way to a certain situation, Someone says something mean to you and you get mad, and then someone one day says something mean to you and you say, wait, what is this feeling? Why are they saying this? And is, is it true? Is it? You start to have some of these ideas coming into your head, then is that a progress? Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah. Like these things, it's not this whole, the whole teaching, the whole gnosis is not meant to be an overnight one day you're going to wake up and it's going to be 
you're going to be there. You're going to be floating around the room and <laughs> spinning out rainbows or whatever. <laughs> this, is, this is a work. It's a work, but it, it's important to remember this is a work that you can verify. You can verify the progress you've made through self-observation. A specific formula in order to pray to our inner Divine Mother is not necessary. We must be very uh, natural and simple when we address her. Like a child who addresses their mother and speaks from the heart. Sometimes being ceremonial, it's nice and it sounds nice, but we, wanna, we want results, we want to connect. We shouldn't spend too much time trying to be formal in our speech to our inner mother when we pray to our heart. We should just be more natural. Like a child who wants assistance from his mother, the child would never think about the words they're going to say and how, how to beautify the words and how to, how to speak really elegantly to the Divine Mother so that she will be complimented and then want to help us. This is not how it works. <laughs> she wants to help us. Our inner beings, they want to help us. We don't have to be formal in the way that we speak. So prayer in the psychological work is fundamental for the dissolution of the I, the ego. We need a power superior to the mind if we indeed we want to disintegrate this or that ego. The mind by itself can never disintegrate any ego. So we can't think some of these things away. We can, we can change maybe how they manifest by trying to be more, but then, then what happens, they become, they hide themselves more. They're still there and we think that they're, it's gone, but it's there, it's just changed form. It becomes sneakier. <laughs> This is how it is. So we need to pray. We need prayer. We need to ask for help from that which is superior to ourselves. So we're going to look at a couple different types of prayer. So it is necessary to learn how to pray scientifically. The person who learns to intelligently combine prayer with meditation will obtain marvelous objective results. There exist different types of prayer, and their results are also different. This is probably something that we've thought about, or we realize there are different types of prayers. And we've learned many types here. Maybe we didn't say that they were prayers, but there are, there are many different ways of praying, and that's what we're going to look at. The first type we're going to look at is egoic prayers. Prayer is meant for spiritual purposes to strengthen our connection with the internal worlds. When prayer is combined with materialism, it then becomes dominated by the ego. For example, you want to pray for money or for fancy cars or fame, etc. I mean, it might not be egoic in some instances to pray for money. Maybe you need financial assistance to help you and your family. But sometimes if you want to pray to win the lottery, maybe that is a little egoic. <laughs> With this type of prayer, we are wrapped up in fantasy, desire, and the consciousness remains asleep. This type of prayer, I mean, everyone can remember some of these just, and we've all done this type of prayer. It's almost like bartering, like, oh, please let me pass that test, and I swear I'll study from here on in, or <laughs> something like this, right? That, that's egoic. It's a, it's a very low form of prayer. It's almost praying in a daydream, kind of like how when... We walk around in a daydream, now we're praying also in a daydream. So the benefits are, are very few, if any. <laughs> it comes to my mind when the, there's uh, fanatics in the sports, when they are in the soccer field and they, yes. they start to pray. pray. And Their team will win. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Does that progress anybody spiritually? No, it's more like a, you have a strong desire and you want to try and put it into prayer form. <laughs> So that's one I think we can recognize. And, and like I said, everyone can recall some of this saying, like, like when you're young, this is the only way that you pray, oh, pretty yeah. much, right? <laughs> Please don't let my mom find out about what I did at school, and I swear I'll be good starting now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's ego up for us. We can understand what we're talking about. And there's something much more elevated, called the Ancient or High Prayer, and it's the Our Father. The Lord's Prayer is one of the most perfect prayers. 
properly uh, pray the Lord's Prayer, it should be done over the span of an hour and in a state of meditation. Because we've all heard, well, maybe we haven't, but we may be familiar with the Lord's Prayer and we have connected, kind of maybe mentally connected it to Christianity or something like this. But this was a prayer that was left by Jesus, a master. And it has deep content that we glaze over when we say it mechanically. So we should disassemble the lines in this prayer and analyze them. People make the mistake of praying the Lord's Prayer in a mechanical way. Gnostics must do the will of the Father on earth as it is in heaven. But men generally call and invoke God so that he may do their will. This is one thing that we need to think about. What, what does that mean? That is true. This is usually what, we usually invoke God so that, with the divine, so they can help us in some way or help us with the, will. And sometimes we need that. We need to do that. We need their help to move on. But sometimes we also need to pray so that we can know what their will is for us. What the spiritual will is. The will of our inner being, yes. Well, there was that um, um, Oksana Bayul. She won the Olympic gold. And every time she stepped on the ice, she did the sign of the cross. Sure, like, yeah. And everybody saw it, and people were commenting on it and things. But right. she did get Olympic gold, probably what she asked for. But maybe, maybe. it was the first kind of prayer. Maybe, maybe it was. Ego. Could be. Or it could be that. like. Yeah. Could be. It could be many things. Or maybe she was meant to get an Olympic gold so that people mm -hmm. could see that she was religious, and then maybe the idea of spirituality could be brought to people's minds who are watching it from television, who maybe... It's pop, there, there are many. And they always, when they have, get the Academy Award, they always thank God, right? How many actors come up there? <laughs> yeah, and this they is thank true. Everybody I don't wise. believe that's an ancient or high No, but they do. There are so many. <laughs> thank God for making me famous. Maybe <laughs> she was just saying thank you for giving me this. It's possible, yeah. To, yeah or maybe for the position they're in. Maybe they're trying to be... Appreciate this. Yeah, show gratitude for yeah, gratitude. their position. Yeah. Like, this is possible, yeah. yeah it's hard for us. We can, you know, we can, we can judge other yeah, people right. all we like, but it's hard... Don't know we don't know exactly mean. why they do what they do or what motivates them. Or maybe to us it seems vain, but maybe it's not. But the odds are she's going to get a goal. <laughs> 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 well, we <laughs> one, one thing that comes into play in these uh, types of prayers is the faith. Yes. When you have faith in something, mm -hmm. yep. that can materialize. Right. Yeah. Uh, I uh, remember a case when uh, there was... Uh, this disciple of Master Samael, mm -hmm. they, they were talking in, in the Master Samael's house, just as we are talking right, right uh, here, right now. And then uh, the disciple uh, notices that the Master, he went silent, he just stayed like this. And then for like a few minutes, and then when the Master came back to the conversation, he asked, what happened, Master? Why did you stop talking suddenly? And then the master said, well, uh, the thing is that there was this little woman, humble woman. She was kneeling down in a very, very far away village in Peru. She involved me with uh, tremendous faith. And she made me like uh, unfold myself. So I went there to help her. And that was the power of the prayer and the power of the faith combined together. So it's something to be. Wow. Because we start, we, sometimes we think faith is something that we can create in ourselves. But faith, some of these things that we don't understand, they're energies, they're, they're cosmic forces that exist. They're their own intelligent principles. Faith is one of those intelligent principles. We learn to tap into it, we can, we can use it for certain principles. So when we pray, there are these masters that can actually tune into us? Yeah, you can. And, you can and help, us? And help yes. us. Yes. But um, our inner being is, if we address to our inner being, he can connect us with the masters right. of the world. Because right. the masters, you know, the our inner being is the master. Yeah. It's a God. So between yeah. that, they understand better. Okay. <laughs> <I think so. laughs> and this way, when we use the inner being to intercede, when we pray to our inner being to maybe ask Master Samuel or, Ma or ask some other Master to help us, then the will of the inner being also will be done so that we don't do our own will by trying to just invoke some Master. If we ask our inner being to intercede on our behalf, to ask the Masters for assistance. That way our inner being's will is being done. Mm.
Who, who's listening? Because they know better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. yeah. That's right. Yeah. You're right. And you start to have certain like experiences when you do certain practices, start to verify things. This will strengthen faith. Mm -hmm. when, when when you start to see that this is actually the way that things may be, then faith comes. Only through personal experiences. Because someone can stand up here and say, this is how it is, this is, you know, this mass is going to help you. But when you have that personal experience, this is what this is what faith is. So the ancient or high prayer, the Our Father, Our Father who art in heaven, that's like a mantra name for the inner Father. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, the internal world. <coughs> thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We want to connect to the inner being so that we can do the will of our inner being here on the physical as, the, as it is being done in the higher planes. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. This is all relating to the ego. And do uh, not allow us to be led into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So this is, the, this is the, our Father, the ancient or high prayer we're talking about. This end part may have been added in actually later. I was just going to say because in the yeah. Catholic church I went to, they said, no. you know, because it, it, at school we used to always say for that, and the and the, the priests would say, no, no, we just stop it. Right. Evil. It was actually because it was added in uh, oh. by King Henry VIII or something oh, like that, okay. when they made the Church of England. Oh yeah, okay, that's. So, but this is part, and if you if you try, I kind of like that line. Well, it the has esoteric line. value in itself. Mm -hmm. The line is the kingdom, mm -hmm. the power, and the glory. Right? Well, what does that mean? Well, the kingdom is Malkuth, the Sephiroth. Oh. Power and glory are the two opposing pillars. Oh, Strength and severity. And so Did it's, the king think of that when he said that? I don't know what he thought. I just oh. know that that's what oh, it relates to. Maybe he just, know. Maybe right. just <laughs> meant heaven, like in general. Yep. The kingdom and the yeah. power and saying, glory. Like, well, see? Malkuth, mm -hmm. the translation is the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Netzach, the trans English translation is victory, or power, and uh -huh. pod, English translation is glory. His consciousness is oh, possible. Mm -hmm. Back in those times, yeah. kings, they would study this kind of stuff. Yeah, that's right. Alchemy that's was right. called the royal art, right? And they would oh, study yeah. these kind of symbols. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So a single Our Father, well prayed and wisely combined with meditation, is an entire work of high magic. After the prayer, we must know how to await the reply of the Father. And this means to know how to meditate, to have the mind still and in silence, empty of all thoughts, awaiting the reply of the Father. But as we said, even, though, even when I ran through that, that that's not... To, to truly understand it, we would have to meditate on it line by line. And we would understand all the depth that that prayer has. It's not particularly solely a Christian prayer, is it? It's, it's maybe from... Christian Bible, but the man who gave it, he wasn't a Christian, he was a Jew, right? And an awakened master. So this prayer is powerful. And sometimes we have to look behind some, sometimes, I mean, I'm not saying this. I had some precon, preconceived ideas about Christianity and all this, but I thought, oh, no, it's a form of just trying to take power from people. But then you realize, no, that's the political side, but there was another side. There's another side where the esoteric teachings were still kept in Christianity. So it's, it's important to be open-minded about everything. And, and if you are a Christian, then this helps you even to get uh, you know, deep, more, more deep understanding of your own religion or your own prayers. Then there's the mantric prayer. We try to practice those at least once a week here. Uh, the vocalization of mantras, when combined with concentration and imagination, awaken our internal faculties. This is a type of prayer. Mm -hmm. Trying to connect to higher powers, to our inner self. Mantras are most effective when recited with devotion. This is just like what Doris, Doris Mel was saying about that other story. When we, when we do these things with devotion, concentration and imagination, we, we then receive the most effects from them. To do them mechanically, maybe we will receive some, and it's good to practice them, but with devotion, concentration, and imagination, we'll go further faster, we'll just say. 
So mantric prayers come in many forms. Those that relate to the seven sacred vowel sounds, those that relate to the words of power, like gate, gate. So this is kind of a little review. We know this, like, this is also an idea of how there are many, many different forms of prayer. Well, there are many different forms of mantras with specific purposes. The vowel sounds, specific chakras. And then the words of power, like gate, gate, are for specific occurrences. Maybe so we can experience the illuminated void, or so that we can connect to the inner being. So mantras are important to help the intellect achieve a receptive, tranquil, and profound state. This is one of the reasons why we have so much trouble connecting to the inner being. Because we're never usually in a receptive, passive state. We're always lashing out. We're always reacting some way, in some form, to what life is throwing at us. But to have the intellect receptive, tranquil, and profound, this is when experiences come, when we are more passive. This is the purpose of meditation. And there's the rune yoga, which we learned a little while ago. This is a type of prayer. Just like yoga itself can be a type of prayer or anything. They're meant to be prayer. Uh, pranayama, prayer, meditation, and specific sacred postures exist within the runic practices. So they combine a number of types of prayer in this one prayer alone. Uh, runic exercises, when combined with faith and devotion, bring the three brains of man, the intellectual, emotional, and motor, into a more harmonious state. The runes are said to be the golden language of the gods, and the use of the rune yoga enables us to connect with the deeper internal aspects of the being. So the runes are, they, they are kind of a strong form of prayer. And people who work with them a lot, they will, they will tell you this, that they have received benefits from doing them. Help to bring all three brains into a more harmonious state. Yes. And there's actually one that helps us with the uh, willpower. Yeah. One, yeah. Will power? Oh, okay, you know, that's what remember? I remember. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Which one was that? Yeah. I think it was with the leg. And so it was Tay, T, T, Dorn, and Dorn. Dorn, yeah. Dorn, and Dorn. I got that. I got yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. That, that helps us with willpower. There, there are a few uh, advanced runes as well that we haven't learned yet, but I think you will learn them in. Uh, Free chamber. Mm. So. I like this one today. Yeah, that's just a good one. Yeah. I tried yeah, it. Yeah. The morning, huh? yeah. Or in the morning or evening. Yeah. Evening anyway. Yeah. 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 It doesn't matter when you do them or how, but it's the, the, the quality of the way you do them yeah. affects the quality that you get out of them. Sometimes if right. I'm in a hurry, that's all the time I have, I'll do I'll do that, you know. Sure. Yes. Yeah. I figure, you know, it's better than nothing. Yeah. Oh, yes. At least I still set myself up. And, and like I say, you know, breathing and run, one of them or three of them done yeah. well with concentration, imagine, is better than a hundred of them done mechanically. That's right. This is important in anything we do, meditation, yeah. anything. That sometimes it's not all quantity, it's quality. Right? Well, with most things in life. <laughs> true, isn't it? Yep. Quantity, this is quality. true. Now we're going to move on to magic prayer. Oh, this oh, is an interesting okay. <laughs> Spells and whatnot. <laughs> now we're talking. So magic prayers are those that we recite with the intention of accomplishing specific oh. tasks. Mm -hmm. For example, the invocations and the conjurations would be considered magical prayers. We do them for a purpose. Sometimes there's more than just saying things. There's also actions that accompany them. So magic prayers are used in various ways to work with elementals, exorcisms, uh, defense against danger, petitions for healing and strength, to magnetize talismans. These are, there's, there's many ways that we can use magic, magical prayers. Uh, the advanced practices of chains are magic prayers. And I believe Phil told me that he showed you. Uh, mm -hmm. yes. That's a magical form of magical prayer. So, you know, we're, we're focusing on a specific thing. We're trying to use our willpower in a guided way. So it is important to be conscious of what we are doing. We ask for the will of the being to be done so that we do not go against the law. Because there are other forms of magical prayers that we, in our mind, maybe we think it's sillier, but there are people who use sorcery or something like that to try and attain things. And 
Those can be magical prayers too, but they they often break the cosmic law. The is law. that bad? Yeah, it is. Oh, yes. You should never impose your will on someone else. Free will is a law. You have to respect others' free will. People can do as they choose. So if you're doing things like trying to make love potions so someone will fall in yeah. love with you, that's kind of going against their free will, isn't it? That's right. So they're forcing your will on somebody yes. else. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the kind of thing we're talking about with magical prayers. So many examples of magic prayers can be found in uh, Master Samuel's book, Occult Medicine and Practical Magic. He has a book, this one, where there's lots of, there's different prayers you can do with certain plants for protection. And oh. There's certain oh, prayers you can do to... Uh, <laughs> yeah, might, I think it's there. It might be about Oh, I'll have to bring it to Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. So it's one of those books, it doesn't really uh, get into like the basis of the psychological teachings, it has lots of different prayers, and it's interesting, it's very interesting. So that's magic prayers. Then there's prayer directly from the heart. This is an important one, this is one that we're trying to achieve. This is a more profound type of prayer. This strengthens the consciousness and helps to form a permanent center of consciousness or permanent center of gravity. This prayer requires the absence of negative emotions and a quiet and still mind. To pray from the heart is to connect deeply with the inner being. It does not even require words. So there are forms of prayer that, that don't require words. This is one. To silence the mind, to let whatever is from the heart flow forth. Maybe it's not words, maybe it's an emotion, a connection, a form of energy, an energetic connection with the inner being. So when we start to work with these things, we find that there are many different levels. This is a higher, higher level. When you work on connecting with your Divine Mother, for example, this will be a higher way of connecting with her. To actually be still, still and silent and feel her presence and know that you have felt it, this is a form of prayer. So, very interesting. So prayer directly from the heart, the obstacle of negative emotion and thought. This is the biggest obstacle to that type of prayer. The majority of human thought is unfortunately negative. Mm -hmm. This just seems to be what we relate to or the way we identify with things. We can probably verify this for ourselves. I mean, we, we've all done it. Sometimes we, the way we think of other people is usually negative first. We, the strongest impressions that people leave on us are the negative ones. Mm -hmm. But remember when people have said terrible things to us for a long amount of time. We can go into a negative emotion. If we start to feel sad or depressed, it can last for a long time. Yes. They said today on the news that a quarter of teenage boys um, want to be someone else. And right. a third of the girls want to be. They don't want yep. to be. They don't news. like themselves. The news yeah. is always negative. This is yeah. This is yeah. probably well, true. But a third, yeah. third, that's really high, right? Yeah. So they don't like themselves, don't want to be cold. Want to be Maybe it's else. you know because there's so much I think it's being worse. pulled so many ways yeah, in society, yeah. and mm -hmm. kids are getting worse. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. More depressed. This is possible. They're getting worse. It's just the, I mean, they, maybe it's something because it's society. Although I do believe every generation does say this. <laughs> just it the next. Like it? It, it is possible. I mean, in some ways, they're. They're oh, also getting better. To it. Like more I'm experiencing my teenage years, yes. and I'm thinking of my kids, and I'm thinking, oh, they're different. I mean, even even when you look back, like I think I know I, I do agree with what you're saying, but also I teenagers and kids these days are they're they're a lot more open and, and accepting in some ways than yeah. teenagers then, yeah. and parents. There's the other way too, right? That's mm -hmm. back when you're right. racism yeah. and you're sexism right, yeah. was all pre prevalent. It's not That's prevalent right. today as it was. Back generations and generations. Yeah. So in, in some ways we are, you know, yeah. so this, this is also what I'm saying. You see, yeah. this is, and, and everyone thinks this way. Because I thought it's my, it's no, but it's not that. Because that's yeah. what I grew up with. So, okay. And the that's negative right, one is the strongest experience. and it comes out yeah. first. We see the yeah. negative okay. the easiest. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. But this isn't just you. This is everybody. This yeah. is how life yeah, is. Right. Yeah. So right. when yeah. no one's picking on you. <laughs> no, I know <laughs> this, is how, this is how we go out throughout the day. That's interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, there are positives and negatives to everything, but it's just sometimes subjectively we become identified with a certain aspect, and that's, that aspect is what we say the whole thing becomes. <laughs> but uh, 
So the majority of human thought is negative. This is due to the fact that we have become so identified with the manifestations of the ego. So we, we, we are so identified with the ego. You'll find this if you self are aware. Very, it, sometimes it's even, it, well, it's not sometimes, most times it's difficult to say, when does the ego end? And yeah. is this just an ego observing that ego? And it, and it yeah. can't be. Yeah. We are very identified. We think the ego is us. This is, this is the truth. Yeah, I'm, I actually, I, I find really interesting even the, uh, like, how I overlooked so, so often in the past the saying, identified with the ego. Yeah. And it was only really recently when I was uh, reading something that, that it really struck me, you know. Uh, the quote was, um, uh, are you thinking your thoughts, or are your thoughts thinking you? Yeah. And uh, I kind of reflected on it for a while, and, and uh, kind of shed some light into the idea of identifying it, you know. We, yeah. we think that we are our thoughts, yeah. and, and that's mm -hmm. why we can't separate ourselves from the ego. It's which, easy to talk about and yeah. very hard to do. Yeah, yes. exactly. This is true. I mean, if you think about, I mean, there's tons of studies that will tell you exactly how many thoughts go through the human mind, and I don't know, it's a, it's a high number. But those, so we always have thoughts running through our mind, and then somehow or for some reason we pick one out, and that's the one that... Okay, well, I want to meditate. No, but I got to do the laundry. I got to do the dishes, and I got to know what I should read this book. And then we pick one of those, and that's what we identify with, and that's what we go and do. See, but we could we, we could just as easily pick a thousand of other things similar to it. <laughs> so. We have become so identified with the dramas of daily life and their impact on the myself. And that's this is the other thing. Right? Any event. We can we can carry these events with us that happen, how it affect how how it made us look, how it made us feel. We can carry it on for days, for months, for years. For years. Some people are really good at folding budgets and but not just that. Right. This is <laughs> right because we we have come. This is why the myself is in quotations with the myself. Myself is the ego. Now we think we are the ego. What happens to the ego affects the ego. It's very hard to separate us from the ego at this point, so we feel like this has happened to us, and now we look bad, and now this person is saying bad things about us, but what is it that's being hurt? Is it the pride? Is it pride? Is it vanity? Is it because it's true and we don't want to accept that it's true? Or is it because that person is having a bad day and they're just venting on us, and then therefore really has no effect on us, someone was just in a bad mood? Yeah, maybe they were feeling negative, so they want to, yes. you know, right? Get rid of their negativity. Your emotions and... How you are, it puts out a frequency for That's other right, people. exactly. But it also sets a path of how you're going to think, you know? Puts yep. your, your thinking in that uh, frame of mind. Like, if you're feeling negative and you're angry, right away, you, you know, your thinking is that way as well. And you're going to reflect that on how you mm -hmm. think about everybody else mm -hmm. or their situation. Right. I mean, if you, if you have, like, I have a family, so it's, it's easier to, it's easy sometimes to observe that in the family. Oh, yeah. Like, um, home in a bad mood and I'm like, oh, work was so horrible today and I throw my keys down and I <laughs> kick the dog or whatever and I walk around and everyone automatically lowers yeah, the yeah, vibration totally. that they're in because uh -huh. you are affecting them. Oh, so what you do yeah. matters. Oh, it yeah. matters even more than we perceive it does. We just feel like, oh, I'm in a bad mood. I have the right to, to feel mad once in a while. I'm justified and so in my anger and we don't really say, well, maybe our daughter wanted to say something to us but then she saw us yeah, kind of like this right. and now... Now she's a little put off and... Yeah, she's scared. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is what we think. <laughs> we always wait for the big things, off. right? Yeah. We're always thinking the big things are what determine life. And I'm pretty sure when we will work with this, we're going to find out it is not the big thing. It is all these small things that we perceive don't have as much importance. But we perceive to be important. We'll find out may be the opposite. How we act around our loved ones, what we put out, this is what's important. So, okay. If we were to become less identified and fascinated with the ego and were able to silence the mind, we would then be able to perceive more clearly that which comes from the heart. So, negative emotions, the ego, this is like a filter, a screen. It makes everything difficult. So, I mean, this isn't about saying that you have to eliminate all your ego and then you can pray from the heart. It's about at least taking time to sit down meditatively to try and silence the mind, to look for that break where the ego is constantly working on you, to silence the mind, to focus on the heart through concentration. So, 
Because I know sometimes I sat there and I'm like, okay, so nothing's going to happen until I eliminate the ego. That's basically what they tell me. Every life you're going to eliminate the ego. All or nothing. nothing. This is, yeah, this is not the case. This is not the case. We're just trying, when you meditate and you take time to self-observe, just trying to, trying to break the control of the ego momentarily. Mm -hmm. And you can perceive things differently. You can have experiences by, by beginning to work in this, in this way. So these things, these things are ver verifiable. Transmutation is a type of prayer. So transmutation is a form of prayer that energetically connects us to the inner being. By working properly with the creative energies, we nourish our higher spiritual values. Working with transmutation can help us to develop devotion to our inner being, the masters of the White Lodge, and to the work in general. So transmutation... Transmutation is obviously it's, it's, it's different than, than alchemy. Well, never we're saying transmutation, we're not saying you have to work in alchemy. This is, this is the pranayamas, this is specific mantras for transmutation. This is, this is working with your retained energies to raise them. Is this to raise the kundalini? Yes, mm -hmm. yes, this is what we're talking about. So mm -hmm. some people say, well, I'm not working in alchemy, I have no partner, I can't work in transmutation. This is not the case, this is not what we're saying. You can. There are transmutation practices that are meant for people who are single, even. Which ones are those again? <laughs> well, we can go over them. We will go over them. <laughs> Refresh my memory. Yeah. <laughs> there are I know ones. the Egyptian pranayamas. That one is important. Yeah, that yeah. one's important for everyone. Single people, married people. But there are other. Uh, there's a. There's some. Of, one of the advanced rooms is for transmutation. <clears throat> but you'll you'll learn it at the pre chamber. There's three advanced rooms that weren't covered before. It, are there any rooms that we've studied that uh, are for transmutation? Yep, there are yeah. some. Like uh, that cow room is to help with transmutation. And, Which one? Uh, mm. Cow room. Okay, both hands up there. Oh, That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, is that the one that we say in the morning or something? Um, um, you can say it in the morning. Towards the east, I'm supposed to face Yeah, you should east. generally face east for all for yeah. all. Cow room. There are some there we can go over, but I should move along and we're running long. <laughs> but it's good. So this will be one of the last types of prayer we talk about, self-remembering. Self-remembering is a form of prayer. Self-remembering is one of those terms in Gnosis that you hear a lot, and it can be hard to define what exactly that means. It was for me, self-remembering, what do I remember? Because I don't really have a frame of reference as to what it is I'm supposed to be remembering if you don't have certain experiences. But there are, there are certain things that help us with self-remembering. It's basically remembering what we're doing here, what our goal is, the connection of the inner being, to remember that we have an inner being. So self-remembering is the act of remaining aware of the higher parts of our inner being. This practice allows us to place the consciousness between the events that occur in life and our reactions to them, which is one of the goals here, right? Because if you don't place the consciousness between uh, the event and the reaction, then you are going to react mechanically, like pre-programmed reaction. You're insulted, you get mad. You're praised, you feel joy. These are pre-programmed reactions. Self-remembering is related with both self-observation and the practice of death and motion. So these are two areas that are maybe easier to grasp than trying to understand fully self-remembering if we feel like we don't have, well, I can't remember what it is I'm supposed to be remembering because I don't have a real frame of reference yet in all of this. But self-remembering is an extremely important practice that helps us to build a permanent center of gravity. This is, this is why we, we practice to build a permanent center of gravity, which we will discuss a little bit later in this lecture. Well, coming up soon. We're almost there. So self-remembering, the importance of self-observation. <clears throat> to know is one thing, and to observe is something absolutely different. We can see this. People are like, well, well, I know that I'm in a bad mood, but this is just the way I am right now. To say that you know that you're in a bad mood, or to say that you know this is, is not the same as observing it. Because if you, sometimes people say, well, you know, I know that that's how I am, that's just the way I am, so 
take it or leave it, that kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, to know it is to know is different. It's almost like to accept and be like, yeah, I'm an angry person. That's how I am. <laughs> this is just the way I am. There's nothing I can do about it. No, there is something you can do about it. You can observe why it is you're angry. What is making you angry? Well, that takes too much work. It's difficult, but it can be done. <laughs> right? I know, but that's why these people say that. You know, oh, this is the way I am, and so you know. I accept myself for for how I am. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> you know. It's, That's almost like a justification of the yeah, ego. Yeah. Just yeah. it should justify what so, yeah. your actions yeah. are, so you don't have to change. It's right. much harder right. to change. Right. It's even hard for us, even any of us here, I mean, like to start with self observation. Mm -hmm. it's, it's difficult. Yeah. It's very difficult. But this is one of the things we must kind of start with. So one can know that they have a negative thought. But that is not the same as observing. Mm -hmm. So we can be like, yeah, I know I shouldn't hope that my arch nemesis doesn't get promoted, but <laughs> we, we, we can know that we have a negative thought, but it's not the same thing as observing it. That's right. Knowing it, like I said, is like accepting it. Observing it is to see where it has its root. Why is it manifesting right now? Where is it coming from? How is it affecting me? What is it making me do and say and act? That's right. This is observing. This, is, this will help. In order to perform, to perform self-observation, one has to divide oneself in two. The part that observes and the part that is observed. This is how it's done. And we say, well, how do you do that? That's also difficult. It would be almost like viewing um, the circumstances in your life like a television program or like a play. You're a specific actor in the play. How are you reacting to it? You're watching this person who is you, but you're not being totally identified, totally engrossed by the scene. You're realizing that it is maybe a scene. This is how you start to develop the split. It is one of those things that we have to practice and that it gets easier once we begin to work with it, like, kind of like working out any muscle. But at first it does seem a little difficult and a little strange, but there has to be an observer and the observer. So self-remembering the importance of death in motion. Death in motion is different from self-observation, but it is connected to it. This practice is performed by asking our Divine Mother to eliminate the manifestations of the ego at the exact moment we first perceive them. Oh. This is death in motion. So we can see it's similar to self-observation, but it's different. This is like where when we, some, something happens and we feel ourselves begin to get mad and we'll say, no, you know, Divine Mother, please eliminate this manifestation. I know, but wouldn't you have to self-observe it in order? Yep. Two. two. Yep. This is true. Two, two, uh, you know, yeah. But this is even like quicker, like as soon as we notice it, then, then we hit it. Okay, so we don't have to analyze it and everything else before we could ask. No, nope, but what we can do is when we, when we work with this, then we can almost like putting a bookmark in our day. So that when later at night when we're meditating, we can do a retrospective and we can say, well, why did that? And then we can, then we can deconstruct the scene. But it serves a purpose, death in motion. It serves a, the purpose is that the, the, this practice allows us to cut off the energy supply to the ego. Thus, we steal its strength and weaken it. Mm -hmm. So... We have to observe our egos that we have, but it's also important not to strengthen the ones that we already have, and it's important not to create new ones. So there's m many things that are going on. Death in motion helps to weaken the egos so that we can eliminate them, so they're not so big, so that they don't take up so much of our psychic energy, right? It's like that, uh, I believe Lee gave the example of the tree and the roots and the hair on the roots. First you have to cut the hairs, and then the little roots, and then the bigger roots. This is how we cut those little hairs and the little roots. Death in motion. So death in motion and self-observation, these terms might start to become familiar now. You've probably heard them in a couple of lectures, but these are important. These are, these are important subjects, and these are, not only are they important, but they're, they're a good place to, to start practically working with the teachings in daily life. Self-observation and death in motion. Especially death in motion, because it can be done easier first, before we have. We can start to work with death in motion, then we can weaken an ego, and then it might be easier for us to observe it, because we're not so encompassed by rage when it comes. 
We're not so overwhelmed by emotions or actions when they come because we've weakened them a little. So the permanent center of consciousness, or gravity, this is a term that came up a couple times in this lecture. We do not truly possess individuality due to the fact that we are a multiplicity of ego. Mm -hmm. This is something we can understand has kind of been the main backbone of all, all the lectures, pretty much. So each thought, feeling, and action depends upon the ego that is currently manifesting in the centers of the human machine. <coughs> the human being is really a machine that is controlled by the legion of the I. The I is the ego. We need to create a permanent center of gravity or consciousness. Fortunately, within the human being exists the essence which is the most elevated psychic material. So we're this multiplicity of ego, of desires, pulling us every which way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we really don't have an individuality as we perceive it. Right? It's like Samuel Moore said in one of his books, you may perceive that Joe, that is our friend Joe, this is Joe and he's a very honorable man, and then one day Joe lies, and then we say, why would Joe lie? It's because it's not Joe, it's... Steve, <laughs> some, other, some other manifestation of an ego through him. We're not continually the same, is basically or, the idea. Or maybe this Joe put on a good mask to fool everyone because he wanted everyone to think he's so honorable or whatever, right. when down deep inside it's just a mask. Yeah. We, he's, behind that mask lurks something else, right. you know? And this is, this is true. And this is actually, you know, this so is the ego because we can see it in other people, but we don't understand that we've all done this. We have all created this mask. Yeah. We've all you want to make an impression. It. But not yeah. only have, are we deceiving others, but we've actually, it's become so fine, and we believe it so much that we are, we're right. actually convinced that we are. Or you yeah. act different ways with different people. This yes, it. exactly. Yeah. Yep. So, continue. Only by establishing a permanent center of consciousness can we individualize ourselves. The center of consciousness. We create soul by awakening the essence. To awaken essence is to awaken consciousness. To awaken consciousness is the equivalent of creating a permanent center of gravity. This is a, one of the ways that Master Samael has put it. it. Sounds very poetic and very nice, and one thing is one thing, and then another, and then another. And, but we have to look at what, what does that mean for us. When we create a permanent center of gravity, we then have true continuity of purpose. So do we, do we really have a continuity of purpose right now? We're being pulled in many different directions. We're going in different directions. We're floating from here to there to there. And then, like, the wind changes, our mood changes, and we go this way. Where is the, where is the center of gravity? Where is the, you know, the continuity of purpose? So continuity of purpose. This means that our actions, thoughts, and emotions are no longer dominated by the pluralized I, by the ego, by the psychological act. Now, this is how we start to develop the permanent center of gravity. This means that we create a central point from which all our actions, thoughts, emotions, etc. originate, the inner being. But once again, we can start to create a permanent center of gravity right now. We are doing it right now, even if sometimes we're not aware of it. Because now, a react, something will happen in life, and we'll start to remember something that we heard here, or something that we read in a book or something that we verify for ourselves and maybe we'll take a minute before we react mechanically. This means that we're starting to anchor ourselves so that we're not so pushed around by the winds of life, that the external influences aren't what drive us, but that we can understand that we are influenced by external forces, and thereby maybe we can diminish the effects they have on us, or even to understand that we are uh, we are moved by external forces. That's kind of a feat in itself. Most people believe they are the ones that are doing things. They're accomplishing things. They're, is it or, or are they just being moved along? This is near the end now. Let's talk about Nanak. So Nanak was the founding master of the Sikh religion in the sacred land of the Vedas. He taught the path of the heart. This is a little story about Nanak, the founder of the Sikh religion. <clears throat> it was a Friday that day, 
and when the hour of prayer arrived, master and servant headed towards the mosque. When the Muslim priest started the prayers, the, the Nabob or the governor and his uh, servant prostrated themselves as is prescribed by the Mohammedan rite. So they went to the mosque to pray, basically what that's saying. And Ak remained standing, still and silent. Once the prayer had ended, the Nabob confronted the young man in indigent. He asked him, Why have you not fulfilled the ceremonies of the law? You are a liar and a fake. You should not have come here to stand like a post. He was supposed to go to the mosque and kneel and pray, but he stood there silently. Nanak replied, You prostrated yourself with your face on the floor while your thoughts wandered through the clouds. For you were thinking of bringing horses from Kandar and not in the recitation of the prayer. As to the priest, he was automatically practicing the ceremonies of prostration, while at the same time his thoughts were in saving the she-donkey that gave birth days ago. How was I going to pray with people who kneel out of routine and repeat words like a parrot? Then Nabob confessed that in fact he had been thinking during the entire ceremony on the planned purchase of horses. This is saying he wasn't going to pray with these people because they were praying mechanically, out of routine. They had no faith and no devotion. This is kind of an interesting story. And then he ended up being the founder of the Sikh religion. But to pray mechanically is no different than living mechanically. <laughs> it's the same. We just changed the form in which we were doing it. We go to work mechanically. We eat mechanically. We have relationships with people mechanically. We pray mechanically. Mm -hmm. this, this brings us no or maybe very little benefit. And there's a story also of Jesus. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Could you men not keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into the temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. So does this mean that Jesus was praying with his disciples and his disciples actually literally fell asleep? Or were they praying mechanically? Right? So continuity of purpose. When we sit meditate, when we try to self-observe, we have to do it with purpose, with faith and devotion, if we want to see the results quicker, and if we want the results to be better. That's tonight's lecture on prayer and will.